Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Personality Pick, where we interview your favorite MMA media, MMA Twitter, and mixed martial artist personalities all over the internet. And uh, I know, second episode back, second episode in a week. It's been a three to four month absence, but two episodes in a week, <sighs> gotta do it, gotta do it. Hit it back strong. And what better way to, to bring back the show and with a friend of the show, a fellow blue belt in jujitsu, Mr. Liam Picks Fights. My guy, Liam, how are you doing and uh, how's your day going? My absolute brother, my day is going fantastic. Right now, I don't know if you're aware of this, but this is like the Super Bowl weekend for wrestlers. Like this is like everything we live for oh, year yeah. round. So we got UFC on Saturday. I got college wrestling on all day. I got my brackets going. I got some upsets rolling. You know, some of my guys, my national champion call, Younger Bastida, went down in the quarters. Ah, can't believe it. So when you look, man, um, that's the beauty of the sport. Like, I feel like when you look at the pure guts, dreams, people just chasing something, I look forward to this every year. I reconnect with some of my teammates, uh, my coaches, stuff like that every year. So for me, this is a blast. Great time of year. I'm having a blast. Semifinals just wrapping up in there. So, man, I'm on a I'm on a freaking wave right now. <laughs> yeah, and not to mention we had Bellator earlier this morning. We have a couple of regionals on right now and Tough Enough and uh, Unified MMA for those who are watching. And March Madness all freaking day. Yale, Yale. on the money line. How We're, many had oh it? Goodness, we just said at the How same many time. Had it? Come on. <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. First and foremost, out, brother. <laughs> yeah. shout out to Cole. Appreciate you, my brother, for support and a grateful dude. Yes, sir. That Blake Perry interview was, was one for the memories. That was beautiful. Hell yeah, man. Blake Perry, I want to still give him a shout out. If you guys don't know, Blake MMA 170 on Instagram. Go give him a follow. Least you could do. This man, one of the toughest men I've ever met in my life. One of the coolest guys I've ever met in my life. Hardest worker in the room. Most positive attitude in the room. I can't say enough positive things about him. Greatest living American, Blake Perry. He will be back once again. Shout out. Shout out to Blake Perry. Without further ado, Mr. Liam, let's tell the people how we got to know each other uh, just over the internet, living so far across, like halfway across the country. Uh, New York, well, not, maybe not halfway across, New York and Cali. Uh, Full way up. across, brother. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> it, it all for, for me, it started when I used to follow Liam before I even had a, a page before I made my MMA Twitter page under Wiz Does just on my personal and always enjoyed Liam's work and the, the content he put out just because it's always been quality. Quality recognizes quality and uh, the man puts in his work uh, over time. I would start to interact with Liam in the DMs. Uh, start to build up my own page as well. Did a couple of shows. The Four Horsemen, never forget. Shout out to the boys, Lou Betcha and uh, Mr. Gordo Gambles. Lou Betcha, rest in peace, the Twitter account. I mean, what an absolute legend. I hope that we can, uh, you know, get in touch with him again soon. But shout out to Uncle Lou there, man. They, they took him down, bro. Elon came after him. Yeah, Mr. Lou, uh, yeah, shout out to him. I know we've had our differences in the past, but hey, I, I never hold grudges. That, that's always going to be my brother. I'm always ready to mend bridges. But yeah, a long time coming, and uh, I'm glad to have you back on the show. Tell me, how have you been, and what have you been up to lately so far in 2024? Well, I appreciate you asking, my man. You know, um, we were talking a little bit before we got on air about our weight loss journey, uh, you know, and, and you were telling me what you've been doing intentionally, but... Um, you know, I was a little bit sick, um, you know, for a couple of weeks and I lost a little bit of weight. So right now, man, I'm trying to put a little bit of weight back on, um, been training, uh, some Nogi with the, you know, the savages over at Henzo Gracie, uh, of Warwick. So shout out to my coach, Dave Maver and, uh, all the other, you know, great individuals I train with, but I've been getting my butt kicked and, um, getting better every day. So I also feel, uh, like I'm going to be competing again soon. So, that's something to look forward to. Uh, definitely got some plans for what I want to be doing in April. Uh, and for me, the biggest thing is just about staying healthy um, because I love to compete. And it's like when I haven't competed for a while, I feel like anxious. You know, when you wrestle, you get a lot of activity. So if you have a loss, you got to get to get it back, things like that. And 
right now I'm just hungry, man. So I, I would like to get back out there and compete soon. So got plans to do that in April. And um, aside from that, what else am I doing, brother? I'm doing the same thing I'm always doing, breaking down these damn fights, talking each and every week about uh, the UFC, but also, um, you know, I, I produce a lot of uh, proprietary information, right? Like I write a lot of notes. I have a lot of uh, information that I make on a weekly basis to try and help myself win. Cause I know that this is a really hard business and there's a lot of people that have different ways of making money. So for example, some people like to make a model or something like that. I'm not mm -hmm. John Fisticato. Okay. I, I'm not going to be over here uh, you know, doing some of those really detailed math problems that some of these people can do, but I can put in some sweat equity and I can do some research and I can watch the tape and know what I'm watching and take a lot of detailed notes. So in addition to doing that, I'm, I'm a nerd for the game, man. I, I figure out new things all the time. I'm always looking for angles, looking for edges. I'm like back testing random uh, data points that I have and just seeing like, hey, is this profitable? Because that's the kind of guy I am. But, um, you know, just focusing on my fundamentals, man. I got stacks of books next to me that I want to be reading, um, you know, on the librarian. behind me. Um, and, and that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to uh, learn more, earn more. And keep the ball rolling in the right direction, my man. God willing, man. That's uh, and and you can tell from the process itself. You you if you guys follow Liam, which I'm sure you guys do. If you follow me, you follow Liam 100%. Uh, you can tell from the work. It's it's all quality work, and you can tell that it's information that has not previously been repeated or will previously been repeated because the the stuff that Liam tests out is it's pretty unique. If you don't follow him which I highly doubt, please go ahead and do that. <laughs> Mr. Liam is uh, is one sharp motherfucker. If, if, if I could say in the in the le least amount of words as I can use. Uh, now, Liam, last time we spoke, blue belt and jujitsu, how many stripes are on that belt right now? You know, my man, uh, I never got a stripe on, I don't think, any of my belts. And, okay. and some people do, but um, the way that, you know, I've had this journey in jujitsu is uh, I, I've been very blessed to spend a lot of time in Warwick, but I started training when I was in uh, college. So then I was back and forth to Ohio. You know, I was kind of in and out of the room a little bit. Then we had COVID kind of shut down the plans there for a little bit. So there's never been like a natural progression, but I could just tell you, man, uh, I feel like a different uh, athlete than when I came in. You know, I feel like a jujitsu player now as opposed to when i got in there i was a wrestler with a you know i had some skills i watch mma right i i know what we're trying to do here um but you make a lot of mistakes and you have some bad habits from wrestling that could get you caught and by this point um i feel like i've i've kind of bridged a lot of those gaps so for me man it's just like i said about staying healthy and staying in the room and competing um i i feel like i could go with a lot of people like good people uh, but I also feel like I could make, you know, a critical mistake. So I'm trying to just shore up my game a little bit more every day, get a little bit better every day, 1%. And uh, I feel like if I grappled myself when I walked in the room at Henzo Gracie's, I'd have turned that guy inside out sideways and and thrown him out the window in two seconds. So um, that's how I feel, man. I, I just, I know that the quality of work that I'm getting is unreal. Um, you know, I, I've, I've been on the mats a long time. Like if you just count like wrestling years and a lot of people after they wrestle in high school or something, they stop and then maybe they get back into MMA. And the one thing that you lose over time is timing, you know, and Jordan Burroughs, he's a legend of wrestling. He talked about that many times. Like he stays in the game. He just always is on the mat because he doesn't want to lose his timing. He wants to make sure he's sharp. And, you know, when I was sick and I was out off the mat for like two weeks, that's like approaching the longest I stay off the mat period. Like I, whether it's in somebody's backyard or at the jujitsu gym or whatever, it's like there, there's just gotta be some wrestling, some scrapping, some, some goings on. And we do a lot of work from the feet as well in our Academy. It's like an optional start, whether you want to go from the ground, go from the feet, both people agree. Um, and you move from there. And so I, in that sense, like I've been getting my cardio back so quickly by just focusing on wrestling rounds after I get some jujitsu and man, I feel like I could do jujitsu for a really long time. You know, just like, even after I, I came back from a little absence, like I, I felt like I could get right back to that, but wrestling rounds, bro, you'll be, you'll put yourself down in, in four rounds. Uh, if you haven't been doing them for a while. And especially if you go at the pace and intensity that I go, and that's the thing that I try and bring to the table. It's like, 
I try and get the most quality out of my work that I possibly can. So when I'm in there, I'm trying my hardest. I'm really trying to give everything. So I have nothing left at the end of the practice because otherwise, like, then I, I find I feel like I have, you know, a little bit of a wasted practice. Then I'm like, I, I could give a little more. So the one thing I'm trying to work on is just getting more technical with my jujitsu. But like the pace, the pressure, the energy, I feel like I've got that in in spades. So um, I'm just trying to refine the game, you know. <laughs> Yeah, and you can tell from uh, some of the videos that you post on Twitter, uh, with, whether they're your matches or your uh, just stuff that you're sparring, uh, that you bring a lot of intensity to the game and you're you're pretty tenacious with your approach. Do you attribute that to the wrestling background or do you think that just evolved as your game evolved? Man, uh, I started wrestling with an eye on mixed martial arts, not like I was going to go do it, but just like, what was I watching on TV? I'm watching guys go for big throws and slams and like judo stuff and all this crazy stuff. And, you know, we had a lot of freedom in my wrestling room where, uh, you know, if you did something and it didn't work, they would be pretty upset with you. But if you found something that worked, they would kind of let you roll with what you got. And I was a weird wrestler, man. I did a lot of stuff feet to back. I did a lot of stuff trying to, you know, put myself up 10-0. And sometimes I felt so tired in the third period, I was running away from you. I was half, I was half, uh, you know, lucid. You know, I was basically out of my feet like a fighter, right? And you see that when you push an insane pace, you can fight for the knockout, as Mike Tyson said, or you can fight for the decision. But it's very hard to do both, right? If you're trying to just swing for somebody's head, then eventually you're going to get tired. And I was always just trying to take people's head off, no matter who they were. And sometimes I got my ass whooped by really good wrestlers too, because like they don't take too kindly to you just trying to you oh, yeah. know, side headlock them in the first exchange. But I've done that to guys way better than me that accomplished way more because I, I was, you know, reckless with my offense. I was trying to put people away. I was trying to throw people. Um, and now I've gotten to the point where I've learned the things that work for me and that don't work for me. And I'm very, uh, persistent about going to the things that work for me. And I'm also uh, a person that understands you don't have to be better than somebody to beat them. And so a lot of people are too focused on like, oh, what am I worse at than this guy? You know, uh, like what I, what's going to go wrong? I'm like, if he gets real tired, I, I don't care if he's freaking Pablo Picasso. He, he ain't going to do art. He's going to be just going to bed. So that's the way I think of it. I'm like, all right, if I could be better than you, I'll be better than you. If I can't be better than you, I'll try and be more fresh than you. I'll try and get you tired. I'll try and do something to make this, uh, you know, instead of about who's better at jujitsu, who's smarter, who who wants it more, who's tougher. Like, I'll just try and start asking different questions if I don't have the right answers, you know, because there's always going to be somebody that knows a little bit more than you. I can tell you there's many guys that beat me in wrestling that had no business beating me. That's just the God's honest truth. Like, between you and me, I was better than them at wrestling, but it didn't matter, right? I lost the match and that's the way it goes. But on the other side of things, there's a lot of guys that I took one over and they're like, this is unreal. Like I'm way better than that guy. And they are, and they're right, but I got them. And that's what it's about. You know, it's not about like who can be the better wrestler. It's about who can wrestle better on the day. So it's the same thing in jujitsu. That's the kind of approach I take to it. Like, yeah, I might run into a guy who's better than me, but can he do it for longer than me? Is it, is he going to be as serious about this when he gets tired? You know, is he as stubborn a prick as I am? Cause like, I'm a pretty stubborn prick. I'm not going to just give it to you. And that that's the way it is. Like if somebody catches me, if somebody gets me, I'm just going to be like, Hey, my hat's off to you because I know how bad I want it. I know how much I hate losing. I like, I, I just know these things. So it's like, uh, if that's the case, then like the guy who beats me, this guy, he really tried hard. He really got in shape. He really prepared. He's, he's a stud. He knows all his, his positions. Like his positions are better than mine. He got, uh, you know, me fatigued more than I got him fatigued. It's like, all right, he checked a lot of boxes here and God bless him for it. That's all I could say is hats off to him because it's not going to be easy. Yeah. I mean that itself, that, that point it's, it's like when people say no fight, uh, when repeated has the same result, it's never going to be the same outcome. And I say that, um, to bring up the point when I first competed, uh, well, yeah, it was my first jujitsu competition in November. It, I purposely chose a competition that was open weight. The reason I chose that was because open weight competitions, more often than not, you're going to have to rely on skill more than overall size and strength. Because especially if you're right in the middle of the pack when it comes to the weight class, because we had people as 
low as 145 pounds all the way up to super heavyweight at 275, 285 pounds. I was right in the middle at 190, 198 is what I weighed in the, the day of the competition. So going into it, I know there was a couple of my teammates that were joining the tournament as well. And I got matched up with one of them in the first round. And I knew that I knew I can beat him. I, I've rolled with him in the past multiple times, week in, week out in practice. And I knew I can beat him, but there was a big weight discrepancy. He was the heaviest person on the mats at 285. And I was at 198. So I had a pretty big disadvantage in terms of weight. And you know what? I was cocky to start and I almost got caught. That's the, the biggest issue when it comes to mixed martial arts, cockiness. You get too cocky. You think that you're going to outclass someone immediately. No, 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 my friend. Time has a, a different plan for you. Tom, Nolan, Nicholas Moda, anybody? <sighs> there you go. Exactly. Similar situation. I, I just went straight into a, a single leg and realized that the dude can just collapse all of his weight onto my back and neutralize the position. And I didn't do the best at turning the pipe and completing the takedown. And I almost like landed flat on my back until I had him in almost like a, a fireman cradle and was able to like kind of lean forward and roll him off me somehow. I felt like I was suffocating <laughs> at first. But once I rolled him over, was able to, to get him flat on his belly, got the rear naked choke, cool. Finals. I go ahead and win the second round and the third round. We get to the finals and it is another one of my teammates who every time we roll, it's it's very 50-50. He gets the best of me sometimes in, in submissions, but in overall, if we were competing for just points, no submissions, I would always win. So it was a bit of a clash of styles. He was a little more aggressive when hunting for the sub, and I was more aggressive in like position over submission. And unfortunately, I went on to lose that match. Uh, shout out to my guy, Anthony. He's also fighting next week on Friday, first kickboxing fight. Wishing him the best of luck. Uh, that's my dog. Like there was no hard feelings at all. But again, it's the the situation where no fight can repeat itself. No outcome can re be repeated unless it's it's a clearly a a, a mismatch. Uh, but yeah, I I know exactly what you're talking about in terms of you going up against uh, higher level wrestling and jujitsu players and getting one on them, and then when you're going up against the lower level competition where you feel like you do have the edge and you do feel like you should have won. And they get one on you. It, sh shit happens. That's just how it is in, in martial arts. But it's all dependent on what you take from each and every role, each and every experience, and how you grow from it. That's the biggest thing that I try to tell myself and tell other people who are other people who are starting off with their wrestling or jujitsu or Muay Thai journeys because it's gonna happen one one day or another. Yeah, everybody gets their ass kicked sometimes, so you better just learn to deal with a little bit of heartbreak, a little bit of sadness. Oh, no, the the woe is me bug, uh, but it's like five minutes to be emotional. That was really good advice that I got when I first started wrestling, and um, that's kind of the way that I treat it, you know? Th one of the things that helped me in terms of competing is, like, I used to get really fatigued, right? And I would get so tired because I put a lot of pressure on myself to go out there and finish the match, go out there and pin him. And if I'm not dominating, if I'm not up by a lot, man, it's telling me that like something went wrong. I, I didn't get my game plan going. And I changed the way that I think intentionally. You know, it's something you have to like work on. But, you know, wrestling mindset, really smart guys that put together this program where they like, all right, think of the matches where you did really good. What were you thinking about? Like, and I, I started to think, and I was like, man, those are the matches where I wasn't putting as much pressure on myself. And I just went out there and just tried my attacks and just went to see what was going to happen. And when you try to just do the right thing, good things happen. I I had a gut feeling one time that a UFC title fight was going to go to the underdog. And it was Henry Cejudo against Mighty Mouse. And honestly, that fight could have went either way, the rematch. But when you look at it, I, I thought Henry was going to win the rematch because his mindset was so different. And I had felt that exact like relief that he was talking about 
what that he described, right? He comes in and the first fight, he's like, I need to win this fight. And he comes in and just gets smoked. He comes in, Mighty Mouse, way better at MMA, just beats him with knees to the body and like bodies him around the clinch. Just gave him a tour of the octagon brutally. Then you look at Henry, like come back and he goes all around the world. He gets all these different skills. But the thing that helped him beat DJ was none of those specific things because he used the wrestling that he had the first fight that he didn't even try because he was getting beat up. What changed the most about that fight was that he let go of the outcome. And when you don't have pressure on the outcome, like what, what else is going to happen worse than I got beat about the head, neck and chest and finished in the first round. It's like, it can't get worse for me unless he like Masvidal's me in the first round against Ben Askren. Like that's the only way that this gets worse than the last time. So it's like, now I've just got to sacrifice the outcome and give my best performance. When you do that, you can have a great performance against anybody. You could beat somebody that's way better than you. But when you go out there and put a lot of pressure on yourself, you're going to get fatigued. And then you're going to, you know, be wondering why you feel like you're drunk in the third round. And you're like, oh, like just leaning all over the place and stumbling and bumbling. And, you know, it it comes more from the pressure. My My college wrestling coach used to say, what, you think the other guy's not tired? Everybody gets tired. But learning how to be tired and just not care and not be, you know, sore about it and not go, oh, oh, it's so, oh what was me? I'm tired. So, like, yeah, you signed up for this. Like, now you're tired, but don't be tired to lose. Be tired to win. Like, spend yourself going for the victory. Don't spend yourself defending everything and just trying to hold on for a zero, zero. It's like, well, well now you've wasted all your energy in, a, in the pursuit of nothing. Spend your energy. He said, I will pick you up and carry you if you give me everything. If you leave yourself with nothing on the mat, I will personally pick you up and carry you off that mat. But don't be mouthing off to the referee or pointing in this guy's face after you get beat and, and show me that you had all this energy left to give and you did nothing. It's like, don't don't be that guy. So it just was a lot of like hard, true lessons. Re- wrestling, there's no bullshit. There's no, uh, you know, whatever. Like half the time that I went out there, you know, in the training room or whatever, I got whooped. And when I, like, I would always go to a new training room and find out, oh my goodness, I thought the last one was the one where like all the really serious guys were. And like, this is when I learned what time it is. No, no, no. There's always another room that you get into and you go, oh, that's, that's what time it is. Like, that's how, how good this thing gets. So there's always another person that could turn you back from the shark into the fish. Always. And if that's, you know, maybe you're the best black belt out there. All right, then hoist Gracie. Like, pick whoever's your legend, your idol. Yeah, that guy. It's like, that's the way that this is, you know? Unless your name is Gordon Ryan or one of these people that, like, can make the claim to the greatest of all time. It's like, there's always somebody out there that can beat you. So Mm -hmm. it's the humility to just say, I'm just going to give my best, try my best, put the result in God's hand, and then then I I I can take some pressure off myself and just say, hey, did I give a good performance? Did I try the skills that I worked on? It's like if I did those things and I lose, it's a two-man sport. Like sometimes you're not the guy. Like it just is the way it is. But it's also like if I could just go out there and have a good performance, get better from time to time, like each time out, I'm I'm a better version of myself. Is that not the martial arts journey? That's what we're all looking for, right? Like I want to use this experience to become a better version of myself. And um, I think that that's ultimately, you know, the result of a lot of failure and a lot of adversity, you know, that's, that's when you start to learn things about yourself and you're like, man, do I still want to do this? And I've gotten my ass whooped 10 million times and I keep showing up because I love it. And I'm like, Let, let's see if I can still get my ass whooped today. You know, I've been doing this a long time. I've been working at it and there's always somebody out there that can't. So the reason I believed in Henzo Gracie of Warwick is because I went in the first day and the instructor beat my ass so bad. And I was like, oh my goodness, like this guy really knows everything that he's talking about because I watch fights and I know what I'm like, I I have a vague idea, but this guy is 10 levels ahead of me in everything. And there's nothing I could do. And that was for me, like the ultimate selling point of what he was offering. I was like, this guy could whoop my ass right now. If you want to, I, I'm not getting out of here alive. So I'm like, I should probably just start studying whatever he's got going on in here. And and it was a real um, you know, turning point for me in terms of confidence and all these other things. Jiu-jitsu is even better than wrestling in terms of the fun and everything. Wrestling's not fun. 
wrestling's brutal. It's, it's hard, not. and and it's like it, it's a, it's a a ultimate truth teller. But jujitsu is fun. So for me, that it, it's the ultimate blend of like, hey, let's put it all on the line and let's scrap and let's get better. But it's also a blast. You know, I have a blast the whole time. Yeah, and you know, ranking martial arts in terms of difficulty, at least in my opinion. Uh, just to get started into training and how difficult it is. I think wrestling is number one in terms of difficulty, not even jujitsu. It's wrestling because of the grit that you need and the cardio right at the jump. With jujitsu, I mean, a lot of guys tend to pull guard and they can play it safe and they just wrap your arms up and they can stall forever and ever and ever. Sure, if it's in competition, the ref's going to split it up. But when you're in the training room, no one's going to be splitting you up when you're doing that. So wrestling, it's a constant grind. And you have someone pinning you down, uh, pressuring you like you've never felt before. And it's it's just a different animal. Then I would say it's jujitsu because it's what wrestling is. But then you add in the little technique of locking someone down and causing more pain. Whether it's chokes, whether it's uh, the arm bars, the leg locks, the, the omoplatas, everything. Uh, jiu-jitsu will, will show you that your grip strength is not what you think it is. And when someone's in there that is tougher than you, that have, that's been doing it for that much longer, they will flip you and turn you upside down into a pretzel. Lastly, I would say it's uh, Muay Thai, kickboxing, and boxing because, sure, you could get your ass beat real bad in any of those facets of martial arts. But I truly don't feel that it's as bad as the first two that I mentioned. With with Muay Thai and kickboxing, I mean, you can just keep circling around and avoiding contact. And some people in the gyms, they do that. And sure, you, you could do that, avoid the pain, but you're doing yourself a disservice for even coming to the class because you showed up to learn. And w- when you're doing stuff like that, I mean, you're, you're really just showing that you don't really want to participate. Uh, but at the same time, if when you combine all those skills and you take it to the next step into MMA, that's where the the real pain starts. That's where the you, you realize, all right, I'm in the training room. I'm getting taken down. I'm getting blasted with elbows on the ground, and then they're tapping me out with a submission. So it's it, it's funny how each individual martial art has a different way of giving you that pressure it's a different form of pressure and at the end of the day when you when you get home and you like look back at your day at training you realize oh shit i really got my ass handed to me in this way i got pinned to the floor i got my ass handed to me someone hit a spinning wheel kick and like knocked my jaw off its place and uh that's where you can tell whether you want to go back or not it's like, that's where you see, do you have the heart to go back to that class? Do you have a, the, the dignity, the, the willpower, and just the ability to fight through the soreness the next day? Because that's what it is. I remember the first day after uh, my first jujitsu class. Next day, my whole body was like, it was jello. It felt like one of those gummy worms. I'm trying to stand up and walk. And my body's just like, tell me, no, you got to lay down. Call out of work just laid in bed all day and ate, went to sleep. I didn't think I was ever going to show up to another jujitsu class. Luckily I did. <laughs> I tough that shit out. <laughs> Dude, it, it, I'm telling you, it, it's a brutal game, but I, I'll say this, man, to credit the striking guys, I can't take any, any false valor, man. I'm not getting punched, kicked or, or hit in the face, uh, you know, and I, it's a, uh, it's something where, you know, am I afraid of contact? No, but um, I just, we, first of all, our gym is like a jujitsu gym, right? So we have obviously uh, facilities to wrestle. We have a wrestling mat that that's what we're doing jujitsu on. But when you break it down, it's like, there's not a striking section of our gym. Uh, now, when I trained at Strong Style in, in uh, Ohio, what was interesting there is I was doing like MMA grappling classes. And so I was working with some Sambo guys. I was going with some MMA guys that were very talented and get my butt kicked a little bit there. Um, especially by the, the instructors, they're very, very talented. Um, and the newly minted instructor, he was a Brown, belt at the time black belt now in Mill Fisher, very talented as well. But when you look, um, they basically had a, a system where it's like, 
working on MMA uh, style grappling. So there weren't strikes, but it was like things that are effective for mixed martial arts competition. And so that was like the, you know, a perfect class for me. I had a blast in there, but man, I, I'll just say like the idea of getting hit, punched, kicked, and then coming back and doing it all again the next day, that is pretty daunting for a lot of people too. Um, and, and for me, it's something where my, my folks, right. They could understand they're like, all right, he goes out there and it's like, it, it's almost like wrestling. Right. Mm -hmm. And like, what's the worst thing that happens to him? You know, he gets an injury here or there. Um, but when you look at, you know, just the idea, like they, they are like anti me going out there and getting hit in the head. Cause I wanted to take a fight, you know, when I was 18 or whatever. And my parents are like, kibosh, kibosh. After, after <laughs> you finish school, then you can see what you want to do with your life. Uh, but like, they're like college first, 100%. And I was like, okay. And so I still, ha it's something that I do consider, but man, I don't want to get it hit in the head. So I'll tell you guys, I, I'm giving my game plan away. I, I will not be trying to get hit in the head. If I have a cage fight, I'll be trying to avoid that at all costs. Um, you know, so that that's the way that I view it. And it's like, um, cause I, I have a brain, right. I got a lot of smarts up in there too. Um, so I don't want to risk that, you know, I do want to make sure that I take care of that. And so, um, it's something that I, I've been very conscious of, but you know, I'm not worried if somebody chokes me unconscious, man, it, it's happened to me before. I'm telling you guys, if it's never happened to you, it's a weird feeling. And you hear some static electricity, right? I, I, I wake up feeling like I was in the greatest nap of all time. That's the, the, the sincere truth. That's how I felt every time I've ever been choked unconscious. It was not a uh, horrifying experience for me. So your results may vary. I'm not telling you to go choke at your friend right now. But what I am saying is like, <laughs> I, I have been put to sleep multiple times in the training room um, because I'm trying to work out of submissions, right? Like if I just get put in a choke, I'm trying to work my way out. Am I, you know, not going to tap? Like, if, yeah, if I feel like I can't get out and I, I'm stuck, I'm going to tap. But sometimes I'm going to try and work my way out first, right? Like I'm just going to see how far we can get into the exchange. And that's that's where a lot of learning takes place, right? So mm -hmm. I'm not afraid of those things. Uh, I, I am very conscious of my defense with my legs and my arms. I don't want you taking that home with you. I'm very, very careful about that. I try and keep very good position to, to avoid that. But that's the things that I think about. It's like, I'm trying to, to play a game here where I don't let you get my arms and legs. And if somebody was to choke me unconscious, it's like, that stinks. But like, my, I, I just wake up and life goes on. To get brutally knocked out or something like could happen when you're striking, it's like, that that is something that I would not look forward to as a proposition. Uh, and I've I've fought before, you know, with you know, like interpersonally a, a handful of times or with friends, buddies, boxing gloves. It's like things that are very lighthearted overall. Mm -hmm. And so like that 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 was plenty, right? I had a headache for 20 minutes in a, a, a friendly sparring boxing match that I won. And I was like, Yeah, this is probably not something you should do every day, just like as a lifestyle choice. They're like. I'm not afraid of getting hit. Like I've been hit. I've been rocked. I've been wobbled. But like the idea of getting flatlined or something, I'm like not on board with as, as a like personal health decision. So that's the way that I view it. But man, it's, it's something where um, it's the risk of doing business. Right. So if I'm doing a, a fight camp, I'm not going to be like, guys, don't hit my head. Like, But like, that's the kind of thing where I just feel uh, from a long-term meta standpoint, I, I would be one of the guys that's not in there every day. Like, let's fight to the death right now and just see who's tougher. Like, I, if if I'm in that, I I love jujitsu because I can bring intensity without ever harming anybody. I mean, I'm not looking to bring the harm the arm right. I, I'm just trying to put you in a choke, man. That's it. Like, I again, I'm giving away my game plan. I know other things. I I have other skills. I can introduce other attacks. But like, ultimately, I'm not trying to hurt people. That's not my goal in life. I don't want anybody to not be able to go home to their family and stuff. Mm -hmm. Some of these people are out there like ripping heel hooks, uh, like the second they get it as hard as they can and like just tearing somebody's leg apart. I, I think that's a scumbag move. I it really is. do. I have no sympathy for that. Um, if you have good skills, then you lock something in and, and you can be slow and methodical and, you know, play somebody's uh, ligaments like a fiddle. I know people like that. I know real leg lockers. and. I have nothing but respect for that, but it's like, 
that's a lot different in my view than just being a scumbag. And like the second you get something trying to hurt somebody in the training room, you like you would be kicked out the first day if you ever pulled some shit like that. And Henzo Gracie of Warwick, I'll tell you that. But like from a, a competition standpoint as well, like that's we're, we're not out there trying to, you know, injure people and, and send them home so they can't go, you know, have a nice meal with their family. But like, are we trying to win or yeah, of course we're trying to put ourselves in good positions and, and, um, and it's that simple, you know, giving people the opportunity to tap. That's just like a human instinct, right? Like that, like letting somebody, you know, say like, Hey, it's all good. Uh-huh. And, and for me, that that's the beautiful thing about jujitsu is like, you could be going all out. All right. It's it. I'm you good. Right yeah. back to just a human interaction. And that that's what it's all about for me. You know, I'm not, I'm not trying to hurt people. I'm not trying to hospitalize somebody, but what do what I really feel bad if there's like a loss of consciousness incident? Not not particularly like that. That's just like for me, not not a huge deal. And I think that the data kind of supports that as well, like from brain health and all that. So it's like it, it's kind of a minor thing. And so e- even if I was in a cage fight for money, I'm trying to choke somebody unconscious. That doesn't leave much doubt, right? Like you can't really be a tough guy about that. You just go to sleep like everybody else. You know, Patchy Mix out there. How many times do you have to teach people this? You put somebody in a real chokehold and they're either going to sleep or they're going to tap and that's it. And so I I think that that's the kind of thing that um, the New York crew has shown a little bit. Aljamain Sterling, is he out there trying to get hit in the dome? No, Sean O'Malley is just a hard guy to fight. But you look at his career, he manages risk really well. He's out there taking people down, taking the back and making sure, hey, I'm I'm a smart guy. I'm trying to keep this brain intact. I'm trying to make sure that, you know, I can do damage to the other guy, get good positions and dominate without getting hit in the head. And it's like, that's a good way to fight. Um, however you manage to do that, that's a good way to fight. And so I try and emulate those guys uh, that that paved the way. Yeah, I mean, very well said there. And talking on the front of Muay Thai and striking, just eating the strikes to the head, over time it's going to catch up to you, whether it's just in the training room or if you're actually fighting. And I can tell from the the numerous guest coaches that have, have joined our classes, uh, from the numerous coaches that I've been under, because for me, I, I don't really stick to one gym out here. I go ahead and I, I go to Classic Fight Team. I go to CSW. I go to the, the American Wrestling Academy here. And An I, embarrassment I try and... of riches over there. <sighs> oh, man. The Blake Builders of the world. Shout out to him. Uh, <laughs> I've seen him a couple of times. And every single coach has a different way of teaching and a different way of administering their class. The The one coach that I have so much respect for, and I'm not saying I don't have respect for all of them, but Coach Tyler Wombles at Classic Fight Team, one of the, the greatest striking coaches out there, former striking coach of Sean Strickland, Bobby Green, uh tony ferguson over the last couple of camps and we have a bunch of young killers out there at uh, classic fight team that are up and coming in the regional scene he he goes and tries to teach the proper technique but also with respect respect your sparring partner respect the gym do not throw with full heat not even 80 percent heat you want to throw with 60 percent heat at the gym you don't want to hurt these people they're your friends at the end of the day, you're learning from them. They're learning from you. And if you're going out there in, in sparring classes and you're trying to drop people intentionally in these rounds, uh, I'm not going to name names on Twitter, but we all know who it is, who who's uh, flaunting that out, um, whether truth or not. But you, you don't want to do that because if if that's actually the case, you'll get kicked out within the first couple of days. And that's just the truth. Uh, no coach has tolerance for that. Uh, Coach Tyler Wombles will will beat your ass if you do that. Like I've seen him beat someone's ass, kick him out of the gym just for doing that repeatedly when he's told him multiple times to to stop with with overthrowing and over uh, overshooting the power. It's just not what you do because at the end of the day, similar to what you were saying, you want to protect what's in here. That's what's important over the long term. Fighting is only temporary. The brain is what's going to help you long term, and. Uh, yeah, just shout out to all the coaches that are making sure, whether it's Muay Thai, whether it's jujitsu, jiu-jitsu, wrestling, shout out to the coaches that are making sure that all their students are safe and all their students are training with proper training et- etiquette because it goes a long way. And 
if there's a gym that you train at that doesn't have that etiquette, maybe you should reconsider and join another gym or maybe talk with management because there, there there's no, no place in the sport for uh, hard sparring and hard training on a regular basis, especially if you're uh, someone who's first starting out in the sport. I remember my my second or third time in, in kickboxing class, uh, this was at the UFC gym. I was going up against a dude that was uh, pretty well, like he was seasoned and he's trained before. He's a, he was a pretty high belt level in Taekwondo, which we all know is not, not the craziest form of martial art, but if you're going up against someone who's their third class, you can style on him for a little bit. And the guy was going at me with full intensity and I'm looking at him I'm like, hey, do you know this is like my third class, right? He was like, yeah, I'm, are we not going like 50% or like 60% for us? He's like, yeah, that's my 60%. I'm like, no fucking way. Dude cracks me in the nose. And I look at him, I'm like, nah, dude, just turn around. I'm not sparring with you anymore. Went ahead, told the coaches, told management. They took care of him. And apparently it's, it wasn't the first time. So don't be afraid to speak up if, if that's ever happening in your gyms because it, it's just not something that you should tolerate, especially as a newbie. But we digress. UFC Vegas 89. We have Amanda Ribas or Amanda Hibas going up against Rose Namajunas in the main event. Mr. Liam, I'm going to go ahead and pull up this, foul, uh, this bout order. I was about to say fight order and bout order, but it turned out to... Combine us foul order. So I'm pulling up this foul order right now. We're going to go through it like old times. And uh, we'll do a rapid fire pick em. Just prediction and uh, method. Who wins and method. We'll go ahead and start with the legend. Mo Usman going up against Mick Parkin. Who do you got and how? Um, so I'll just level with you and say that I'm going to be taping a lot of these fights into the night. Because I haven't written my prelim uh, preview Indeed. yet. So I don't have like an official pick. But what I will say is like from a, a value standpoint, for me, it's it's got to be the dog or pass situation here. The only reason I say that, strongest underdog trend on the card is Mo Usman um, leading into this. And Mick Parkin, I feel like is all right. I bet him as a dog on contender series against Eduardo Neves. But like just because he trained with Tom Aspinall, I don't think that means he should be a favorite every fight. You know, just like being Kamaru Usman's brother doesn't mean you should be favored every fight, but like he isn't right. Like everybody hates him. Everybody thinks he sucks. And, um, you know, he's kind of just a big athletic guy. And I think that he hits with a decent amount of power, nothing crazy, but he can knock people out in this weight class. And I think that if this fight turns into a gross, sloppy, you know, push fest, which is, you know, very reasonable, then you'd probably want the plus 125, not the minus 150 long term. Otherwise, you'd get barbecued. So, um, that's just the way I see this one, but not a ton of conviction. Yeah, I, I feel like uh, a lot of people tend to agree with that take as well, just given the... I think it's probably due to the, the last outing for Mick Parkin, too, uh, against Kyle Machado. Did not look the best. Cardio didn't hold up. And against a guy where most of us thought uh, didn't belong in the UFC, and Mick Parkin was coming off a, a pretty good win, just didn't show too much uh, too much heart and was getting wobbled left and right. So he's very lucky to come out with a win there. Uh, but yeah, I do agree. Mo Usman is the, the prediction for me, probably by decision. Next up, this is probably my favorite fight of the whole card right here. Igor Severino against Andre Lima. Crazy fight, fun fight. I'm probably going to end up being on the sidelines for this one. Um, but the way I see it, uh, I think Lima is just a little bit more seasoned. I think he's a little bit uh, more physically developed. Something I talk about a lot is just if if you're 25 and below, then I'm starting to worry, um, you know, about your physical development. And so you got a couple 25 year olds versus younger fighters on this card. And um, you know, 25 versus 20. I mean, I, I feel like um, you know I've changed physically since I was 20 years of age. So uh, it's just something to consider. But I, I don't have the strongest thoughts here. I think they're both good fighters. I just think Lima's probably a little bit more sound. Yeah, I tend to agree here. Lima is uh, someone who I've backed in the past. Uh, really good in the pocket. And I think that's where he's going to do most of his damage. Igor Severino is a very good fighter, I will say. But he his downfall is his defense in the pocket. Um Sometimes he tends to overextend himself and get a little too aggressive. 
leaving a lot of openings when it comes to pocket presence. And Andre Lima, with the striking pedigree that he has, I think he's going to be able to, to touch the chin a couple of times and probably get a late finish here. Uh, that's just my prediction, whether it's a knockout 2-3. But, man, this fight is going to be fireworks. I can't wait. Next up, we have uh, Montserrat Rendon going up against Daria Zelensnikova. I still haven't taped this fight this week, and I, I regret the fact that I have to do that before the night's over. <laughs> Save yourself the time. Uh, I think it's if it's uh, Rendon's victory, then she's probably wrestling to a 30-27. And then uh, if it's Daria, she probably could take her out by TKO late or uh, win a decision just keeping it standing. Really strong striker, uh, good fundamentals, and she's really fast. Uh, but Rendon came out last time, showed the physicality, the cage pushing, and uh, I think that could work against Daria just because she has some pretty weak defensive grappling. But it just depends who gets their uh, who gets their game plan going first. Next up, we have a debut from Stephen Nguyen going up against Jarno Ahrens. Yeah, um, I don't feel great about this fight, but if I was forced to take a money line shot, I'd probably go on the Ahrens side. He's got the UFC experience under his belt. Um, but I also just don't love his cardio. Um, you know, in his last couple of fights, kind of hard to address that unless you get on the the uh, sauce. So hopefully Jarno Aarons is sauced up here uh, for the underdog backers. But when I look at the uh, fight overall, I just think that I, I could see both these guys finishing it, honestly. Like, I think Jarno Aarons is pretty good on the counter. And like, Stephen Wynn's style is like, I'm going to stand here and let you counter. So, you know, he throws a lot of volume, but like in doing that, there's a trade-off, which is like, you're standing there, right? You're not moving in and out of range very often. So it's like, I could just start to load up some bombs and see what happens. And it's like, that's kind of what I think Jarno Aarons is going to do here. Um, but I think he might collapse under the pressure if he does not mm -hmm. uh, get him out of there at some point, because when is going to keep throwing. So I just feel like it's on Jarno to show better finishing instincts. He had a near finish against Gomez with the triangle choke. Yep. Like he had a good entry there, and then he had a near finish against Sung Woo Choi, and he just let him off the hook. So, like, if this guy goes three near finishes and, and just never gets a UFC win, I'll be like, hey, you know, whatever. But I just feel like he's probably the money line side here because Win was fighting just tomato cans on uh, contender series. No, I'm playing. I'm playing. But like, they they were just a uh, little bit little bit below the average uh, quality of contender series fighters. I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I don't have the, the the strongest conviction in this one either, but I would say Aaron's likely the the money line side in my opinion, just because of the the strength of schedule. I mean, sure, his losses were to, in my opinion, decent level competition compared to Win because William Gomi and uh, Sung Woo Choi, they're they're not the greatest, they're not the cream of the crop, but they do have uh, some game. And Sung Woo Choi specifically, I've been a big fan of the guy. Uh, striking wise, but it's just, it just looks like the chin has gone away from him just a little bit. Uh, but he put up a fight, put up a really good fight. But this is another good fight here. We have Miles Johns going up against Cody Gibson, fellow uh, Ultimate Fighter alum. This is a night of Ultimate Fighter alum, and I was just going to pull up the odds board here um, because I don't want to talk about a line if it's uh, starting to get a bit stale. But essentially, man, I don't have the strongest take on who's going to win this fight. If I could be frank with you, these are two guys I like long term, I'd look to fade. Um, uh -huh. Just the style of betting that I have, like that's kind of the way that I approach, um, you know, these kind of fighters. But what I'm seeing on the board is uh, the fight not to go the distance is like plus 120, plus 125, some numbers like that. And uh, that's kind of the way I'd invest in this. Like if you listen to the Cody Gibson interview, he's like, I'm having a kid, like, you know, I got to get in and get out. Like I got to like, just make it happen quick. Yeah. So I'm like, uh, what? Like, and he's saying like, he's just going to get in his face. And honestly, I don't trust miles John's chin and I don't trust his ability to handle pressure. But on the other side, like I kind of feel the same way about Cody Gibson in some ways. And like, normally when he gets finished, it's a submission. Um, but I think he could get hurt. I think he could get, um, out of position in this fight and miles Johns can crack, you know, like he does throw with some power, 
So I feel like this is a fight with a lot of volatility in it. I feel like both these guys could make a ton of huge mistakes uh, that they live to regret. So yeah, I plus money fight not to go the distance in that instance. Something I'd kind of look at when one guy's telling you, I'm going to march across there and get in his face and be crazy. I'm like, all right, let's find out. I mean, that that's either going to go really well or really poorly, I feel. Yeah, this one, I being honest, I didn't take, but just from memory, uh, I'd probably lean Cody Gibson, just longer guy. Uh, I feel like he's a little more violent, has more uh, opportunity to finish, but no, no conviction at all there. But we have one of the most fun fights on the card here with Ricardo Ramos going up against Julian Arosa, where I'll take I'll take the lead here on this one. I think uh, Julian Arosa should be the favorite in this spot, although he makes some uh, pretty crummy uh, decisions and his IQ isn't the best. The one thing that Julian Arosa gives you is if you can't get them get him out early, he will show you hell, and he will put you through the the depths of of this game. And Ricardo Ramos just to me is a guy that, with all due respect, seems like he has some quit in him. Uh, we've seen it a couple of times, and when he doesn't get his way, he starts to crumble under pressure. He does not like the pressure at all. And Julian Arosa himself is quite frankly the definition of pressure. Uh, I like the striking from Arosa. I like the volume from Arosa and the output. Uh, he, it's just a matter of is he going to stick his his head into a guillotine or not, or uh, get his back taken. You know, I think this is an interesting fight. Um, I don't love the chin of Julian Arosa. That's the one mm -hmm. thing that always gives me pause with betting him. But then you look at the underdog trend over time and you're like, damn. Like, if you just system bet this guy when he's a dog, you're making money. Uh, one of the strongest underdog trends on the card for Julian Arosa. So, yeah, I would not be ever on a Ramos money line in this spot. Uh, honestly, I feel like his props are kind of shite as well yeah. if i had to be frank with you and he's a guy that i feel you you could actually find difficult to handicap in some ways because he could win by any method you know like he could win by submission he can you know win by knockout in crazy fashion uh he's done it against good fighters um but then he could also just like kind of wilt in random fashion against charles jordan everybody's like what yeah. and charles jordan that's his signature move though man what the, the guillotine renaissance is so freaking uh, up in my house like that. We are rooting that on every day in my house. We're, we're very thrilled about that. But the guillotine revolution, like you don't have to be the better grappler. Just put his head in a vice grip and see how he feels about it. Like most people are not going to love that. So, um, you know, the one thing I will say is like Ramos has definitely, uh, you know, implemented wrestling kind of style takedowns and trying to take people's back and stuff. That would be my only concern for Arosa here is even if he doesn't get submitted, just like giving up some bad positions and getting like body triangled in Weasley fashion. If you know what I mean? Like that's yep. kind of how I feel Ramos would have to mitigate some risk, especially if he gets tired uh, in this fight. But I do think Arosa's live to submit as well. Cause like, if you go back and watch the Sean Woodson fight, Sean Woodson like drops him, but he's so exhausted that he can't do anything about it. And like Arosa just gets back up and keeps going. Like, that's the one thing that's fascinating about the guys. Like if you don't knock him dead, like he will be rocked. And like, even that Padilla fight, he's like trying to convince the guy, let me keep going because he doesn't want out of the fight. He wants to keep fighting, but his chin just fails him. So that's the thing is like, I think he could be the recipient of like another spinning back elbow knockout and be on in this guy's highlight reel. But I think that for the price, he, it's a money line underdog or pass situation every time here. Agreed. On to the next one. We got Trey Ogden against Kurt Holobaugh in what seems to be the Twitter talk of the week. Um, we have a lot of people taking Ogden, a lot of people on the Holobaugh side. Me personally, I feel somewhat strongly about Trey Ogden in this spot. Although uh, he is a guy that is uh, not the typical archetype of a fighter that I usually like to bet on. Uh, quite low volume. Uh, doesn't really look for the wrestling too often, at least in the UFC. But we know he has it in his back pocket. But the man just fights with uh, such intelligence. And he's he knows how to stick to a game plan and make it work. And against the guy that is coming back to the UFC, making his, uh, uh, his return to the UFC at 37, uh, seems quite hittable, can be wrestled. 
Uh, I think this is a guy that's easy to game plan for. Um, and with a guy in Trey Ogden who has shown that he has the wits about him in terms of using his brain in fights, I think this has Trey Ogden ran all over it on the money line. Uh, that's just what I feel personally. What do you think, Liam? You know, man, uh, I don't have the strongest money line thoughts here. I will say the picture of Miles Johns and Trey Ogden standing next to each other, I was like, same doctor. Uh, but when you uh, when you look at like Kurt on the other side, like Kurt's a violent guy, um, you know he comes out with some bad intentions. But to your point, you know he's kind of fighting pretty meager level of competition. I'd say Ogden largely is fighting the same. Uh, Zell Huber probably a standout among them. But like if you look at uh, you know how he's fared, Ogden's looking a little bit better in his recent fights. You know uh, I I feel like he's a guy who's grappling is like a little bit, you know, uh, hit and miss, right? Like I had seen some questionable footage in the Levitt fight that left me a little bit befuddled, but Levitt's also just a weird grappler, right? Like he approaches it in a different way. Um, he's kind of a tricky guy to deal with in his own right, but like watching that fight and I believe Jordan Levitt got him in a really deep guillotine. Um, that was one thing that gave me mild pause here. Uh, because Kurt is just like a, an all out guy. Like he, when I talk about having nothing to lose, like man's like, well, I already lost every time I was here before. It's like, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm half kidding, but like when you look at Kurt, he did get dealt from the bottom of the deck in a lot of ways, you know, he, he fought pretty tough opposition. And, um, this is a fight where I think he's going to come out and, and throw like crazy. Um, like, I think he's going to try and be super violent. Um, he might even adrenaline dump here. And, when I look at Trey Ogden on the other side, you know, I think he he's probably way more likely to make good decisions over 15 minutes, um, which is probably why he's entrenched as a favorite here. But it, it does just give me a little bit of pause because, like, it, it is one of my betting fundamentals to bet on the more dangerous fighter. And Trey Ogden is saying, like, I'm going to knock this guy out. But, like, are you, are you sure? <laughs> like, cause, like, that's the one thing about him. Like, I feel like he's – he had an opportunity, a real opportunity to finish that last fight and they screwed him. That was brutal. But like, I don't know if they're doing him any favors here. Like it's obviously an older guy, but like, I, I just feel like they don't care who wins. That's my God's honest truth opinion about the UFC matchmaking this. They're like, put these two guys on a card, but you know, get a couple tough guys all on the same card and just see who deserves to be caught or, or stay. Like, I just feel like it's a house cleaning, you know, spring cleaning. That's this card. That's what they should have called it. UFC Vegas 89. Spring, spring cleaning. cleaning. I love it. <laughs> yeah, I think Ogden might be able to just out physical Kurt. That's just another thing. Just the physical appearance of Ogden standing next to Kurt is like, damn. It's like night and day difference in terms of physicality. But we'll we'll see. It's uh, less than 24 hours away. On to the next one. Another uh, Another guy who I'm very familiar with, trained with quite a bit. Uh, Fernando Padilla going up against Luis Pajuelo. I'm going to let you start this one off, my brother. Well, sure thing. Um, you know, pretty big size discrepancy here um, in favor of Padilla. You know, uh, something I took note of. He's also a more experienced guy. You know, he's been fighting at a little bit of a higher level, I would say, overall. And he's got a couple of UFC fights under his belt. So um, I think it makes sense that he's favored to win this fight. Have I been extremely impressed? Um, you know, I thought that the fight against Kyle Nelson was a, a mildly concerning performance, but I actually picked Kyle to win that fight. Kyle looks like he is, uh, yeah. you know, found all the right supplements at this point in his career. My man is showing up shredded, dude. Um, and when you look, he's also just putting in a lot of work and um, he trains with pretty good people up in Canada. So I think that Kyle Nelson has put together a better skill set over time and He's just kind of a, a stifling, weird guy. And um, he lands pretty powerful shots in a lot of his fights. His problem was always that he would just gas out and, like, you know, then be found out a little bit, um, including the Billy Q fight, somebody we'll discuss in a bit. So when I look at Puelho here, I think he would have to be the first guy to knock this guy out um, in Padilla, which I don't think is extremely likely. Um, and I think his other path to victory here is just, like, making it a really gritty competitive decision, kind of like Kyle Nelson did. And, you know, just walking him down, staying in his face, throwing boxing combinations. That's what he wants to do. Uh, Corazon de Leon. I think he's willing to take a lot of damage, keep coming forward and swinging. But 
I, I do think, um, you know, Padilla might just have, you know, a little bit more experience, a little bit more savvy, a little bit more sound, um, and also probably a little bit more well-rounded at this stage of his career. So for those reasons, I think that Padilla is probably the side here. Uh, but this is another one where I'm going to do a little more tape overnight. I don't want to shortchange Poelho. Um, I haven't rewatched his tape recently. I have a document on it, but um, something something that I'm keeping in mind. Yeah, I'm not going to speak on the Padilla side too much just because obviously I've trained with him. Um, been at Timo Yama over the past couple of weeks, uh, and he's, he's looked phenomenal. That's all I'll say there. Uh, he, he's a guy that knows how to use his length in terms of the striking. I think this fight is a car crash and whoever imposes their will on the other more and first will likely come out victorious because being honest here, I think both guys block punches with their chins, with their faces, and uh, they have no regard for defense or the ability to stay safe. They just want to get into a firefight. And in fights like this, I don't really like to pick a side. Um, I was very surprised to see the under two and a half at minus 125. I thought it would likely be minus 160, minus 170 range. So I was, I was very happy to, to get that number. And um, I went ahead and invested on the under two and a half here just because I feel both guys are there to be hit. Both guys are aggressive and uh, it does not seem like any of them like to take the back foot at all. So it looks like it's going to be both guys in the center of the octagon swinging heavy leather until uh, someone drops. And uh, as long as someone drops under two and a half rounds, I'll be a happy man. On to the next one. We got, where are we at? Billy Q going up against Yusuf Zalal. And I'm just going to put this out there. I have not taped this fight. I am not interested in this fight. These are two guys who I'm not really high on at all and did not see uh, an investment worth making. But my brother Liam, I, I'm sure you have something on this fight. Yeah, man, I, I do, as a matter of fact. Um, you know, I, I had Yusuf Zalal at the plus money earlier in the cycle. Um, I think the simple reality is that Billy Q is just a little bit old for the division, right? He's 35 years of age. Uh, he's been alternating wins and losses for a while. So I'm not speaking out of turn when I say, you know, the results haven't always been there. Was anybody, was their hair blown back by that Damon Jackson performance? I, I, again, I'm not trying to sling mud. Like this is a New York guy. This is one of the coolest guys in the UFC, but like we got to be analysts, right? When we're talking about money and um, Yusuf Salal is a young man. Who who has ever blasted Yusuf yeah. Salal and got him out of there? It's like he's young, 27, wants to be in there real bad, trains with the best guys, you know, Brandon Roy Val, you know, very talented guys. So a, am I thinking to myself, like, man, this this guy, Yusuf Salal, he's not getting any better. No, he is getting better. And like, what was his problem in the UFC? They kind of let him know, like, bro, you need to go out there and finish people. So is he finishing the highest level guys? No, but he's out there finishing people. Uh, in kickboxing, finishing people in mixed martial arts bouts with his hands, with his feet, uh, you know, <laughs> with his uh, submission game as well. So it's like when you look at this guy, he got a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. He, he's a well-rounded guy. He's been outlanded like once, twice in the UFC in like seven fights. So it's like he went out there and it almost became the first man and only man to ever finish Demon Blackshear with strikes. Like, is that not a feather in your cap? Like, at what point do we give Yusuf Zalal any credit? Like, I just feel like at 27 years of age, you know, people are ready to write this guy off as a fraud or a phony baloney or something. I'm like, first of all, the UFC signed him once. He went on a three-fight win streak. Then things went sideways for him, loses three fights in a row, drops down a weight class, has a majority draw, gets cut from his four-fight contract. It's like, sometimes that's a business and it's a lesson. And they say, hey, man, listen, we like you. You got to finish people. That's the problem. You should go into the judges every time. They're going to screw you. Okay. Judges screw you. that. You know what uh, is a funny expression from my wrestling coach? He used to just say when he was about to send us to do more laps, ref screwed you. Like then it's not me. It's the ref. Oh, ref screwed you. And now you have to envision like, yeah, but this might happen in real life. I got to be ready. Ref screwed you. And I just feel like use of the law ref screwed you. He's done with that. I think he's going to come out here and really try and hurt Billy Q um, and put him in bad spots and bad situations. And, uh, I just didn't like the reactions to some of those shots from Damon Jackson. You know, I, I was kind of concerned for Billy Q in that fight. And, you know, to see him against a young guy here, an up-and-comer, a violent guy, I, I just think that 
you know, some of his typical advantages. Like, when have you seen Yusuf Salah gas out in round three? That's just not a frequent occurrence. Um, you know, he's training at altitude with these guys. He's a savage. So I feel like the the let him beat me up and then come back later on game plan, I, I think that might not work here. So th those are my feelings on this fight. Yeah, and to, to your point, I do know quite a few sharp individuals who are on the Zalal side uh, at that plus money number. So it seems like everyone's aligning here on, on the Zalal side. I, I will stay on the sidelines. I wish you all the best of luck, and uh, I hope you guys cash those tickets. Well, now it's like minus 110. I, I wouldn't take uh -huh. it either. So <laughs> Yeah. Now we have the actual Twitter talk of the town. Peyton Talbot going up against Cameron Simon. The battle of the two prospects. Um, is it me or is the screen frozen? Wait, let me try uh, removing this and adding it back. Uh oh, we have a, a case of. There we go. That's the issue. There it is. Peyton Talbot going up against Cameron Simon, and uh, we have two guys who have really similar styles in a sense where. They, they like to throw a lot of strikes. I think this this fight's going to primarily stay standing on the feet. Um, for the most part, Simon is a guy who, who likes to initiate some grappling here and there, but most of the time it's him defending the takedowns rather than initiating. So uh, I personally think this will stay uh, standing for all 15 minutes. And both guys throw a lot of volume. Both guys try to pace their opponents to a victory and Quite frankly, both guys have really good uh, cardio, so it's going to be a matter of who lands cleaner, who lands more often, and who lands the, the the harder shots. And I think Peyton Talbot is the guy who is a little more crafty at landing shots, and I think that's going to go a long way in this matchup. Uh, Simon isn't the the most defensively sound, and I'm not saying Peyton is either, but uh, just the creativity and the striking of Peyton might give Cameron some some pause here. Uh, I would not play Payton at this number anymore, though. I think the number has stretched a little bit. Uh, let me go ahead and see where we are at currently. I think it was uh, minus 170 when I last checked. We are currently at, yeah, minus 158 for uh, Payton Talbot. Yeah, I think the line has blown out quite a bit. For those who got him at minus 110, good on you. Um, I, I think Payton is the, the rightful favorite, but... Probably accurate, accurate line here. What do you think, Liam? I think this is a really hard fight to call. And last week I picked Isaac Dolgarian. I thought he won the fight, but I had the sense that God gave geese to not bet on it because I just had a bad feeling. And, um, you know, in this one, when I'm looking at it, I, I think Peyton Talbot's going to win the fight. And the reason I feel that way is because I think that there's something um, – that he does really well, which is break people over the course of 15 minutes. And I think that that's a really good skill to have. It's kind of what I was describing as my style before. So I understand what he's out there trying to do to people. He's like, I'm going to, I'm going to see if you want this as bad as I do 15, like, you know, 10 minutes into this. Right. And most people, their answer is no, because like at the beginning, everything's going smooth. But when things start to go sideways, a lot of people are like, Ooh, this, maybe I'm not the guy I thought I was like, you know, you start to ask these questions and, and that's the truth. And so I think that when you have a guy who's 25 and he's kind of had, you know, a bunch of fight cards built around him um, in terms of the a one combat and, and that scene with Uriah Faber, I think they've kind of brought him up the right way. Uh, and then they bring him to contender series. And I do think this is a fight where he's going to meet some early adversity. I mean, Cameron Simon's not a punk. And he's going to go out there and fight really hard. And I do think that that fight against C-Rod speaks well to his character. You know, he didn't go out there and quit. You know, he's a little bit out-muscled, a little bit outsized. But C-Rod's not a proven finisher at this level. Fact. You can just go look at the data. Don't don't trust me. Trust the data. Data says he's never finished a UFC-level fighter, um, except uh, Charlampos, Gregorio, um, that I can remember. So, yeah. And is Charlampos going to still have a job with the UFC next week? I'm not sure about that. Um, I hope he does, but like it just it, it wasn't a great look there. Um, you know, especially the raise in the hand after you clearly lost the fight. I was like, brother, put that hand down, my man. Uh it's not it's not the time. Brother, uh, brother. Uh. <laughs> uh, 
dude, that's classic. But I like Peyton Talbot. That's the bottom line, man. Uh, Nicky Geary, you know, he got to some good positions early. The one thing I'll tell you is, like, I said the exact same thing last week. I was like, whether you want to bet, on, you know, like, if, if you want to bet on C-Rod, the time to do it is after round one. And I was like, the reason I say that is just like, let's make sure that everything goes smooth in round one. Let's make sure we survive, right? Because Isaac's going to go out there and put this hellacious pace on you. But I was like, get a better number, knowing that he survived, and then hope for that. Like, if that's how you wanted to play C-Rod, I thought that was a really sharp angle. Um, and so it was a fight that I didn't have any investment in. But, like, I, I thought that writing was kind of on the wall. I think for the Simon side, you know, he's got to come out here and really establish something. He's got to hurt Peyton. He's got to put him under some pressure. He's got to make him reconsider uh, his confidence because Peyton Talbot is a really confident guy. And that shows over the course of 15 minutes. He can't lie in fighting. And he kn- he comes out for a round two, like knowing I got this guy figured out now. Now it's going to be a problem for him. He came out, especially in round three. And he was like, this guy's got nothing for me. Brink sticks in before the fight even starts round three. That hurts. If you're on the other side of that and you know you're flagging and this guy is telling you, I know exactly where you're at. You want to quit. I know it. I'm going to make you do it. That was a tough spot to be in. So I'm just telling you, like, Cameron Simon, I think, has been mostly able to avoid the really dangerous positions and situations. And uh, I just think Peyton Talbot's willing to put himself in danger to create those. So round one, things might get a little dicey. He just puts his chin on the line. He takes a lot of risks. Um, you know, I think Simon could ground him if he wanted to, but look at that long ass neck, man. You see that profile picture? My man got a long ass neck. And um, I think that there's a chance that you could see Simon get put in some bad positions here. Peyton Taub is 25 years of age, fully grown man. And, um, you know, I think that that physicality gap may show like it did in the Rodriguez fight, but I think it's a fantastic matchup. Uh, and that's why I didn't invest any money. I respect both these guys game hugely. Shout out to our guy, Dan. Shout out to half the battle, another good guy from the industry, my guy Dan. If you guys don't follow him already, I'm sure you already do. If you follow me, you follow Liam, you gotta follow Dan. So it's uh it's hard to to not when you're connected in this industry like like we are. <laughs> Smash the like button. And the the real question is is Leo watching too? That's the that's the real question. <laughs> On to the next fight, we got. Edmund Shabazian going up against AJ Dobson. And uh, I think this fight, at least in my in my world, it's a little uh, easy to predict. If Edmund shows up the same way he's shown up in the past, where it's round one or bust, I think um, he's going to have a hard night in the cage. Uh, AJ Dobson is someone who I'm not so high on at all, but he's shown some resiliency in the octagon. And to his credit, he has some pretty powerful kicks, and his striking is half decent compared to to Edmund, where he's still somewhat figuring out that striking. More of a jujitsu guy and a front choke kind of guy. And we all know with Edmund, he has the the five to seven minutes of cardio, and then he starts to fall apart. Whereas AJ Dobson, I mean, we've seen him battle some adversity and and go to round three before, and still look half decent. So I think. If, if it's uh, Shabazian, it's got to be early. And if not, I think uh, Dobson runs away with it late. What do you think, Liam? Yeah, I, I tend to agree with you. Um, my article pick was Edmund round one. And, and the reason that I ended up going that direction is just I think there's a pretty substantial gap um, in the speed in the early going. I think Edmund's kind of hard to read. And I also just – I'm not sure that Dobson has any – plus level skill relative to Edmund in round one, um, which makes me a little bit concerned. Now he's an Ohio guy. Um, He's training at some of the same places I frequented. He's got some of the same coaches that I know. Um, And so I really respect what AJ is doing. You know, he moved from, uh, or at least I assume that he moved from Columbus down to, you know, Northeast Ohio because he ended his affiliation with the immortal fight team. And uh, you know, he kind of moved on from West side barbell and a, a few things that were really important to him. Um, And I think that was to seek out better training partners um, and, you know, a little bit more professional uh, opportunities, but he, he had a serious MRSA infection at one point on his shin and it did leave me a little bit concerned. Uh, It was a while back. 
you know, he's obviously recovered from that, but I think he's had a couple like a knee surgery as well. Um, so he's just dealt with some like difficulties outside the octagon. You look at the fact he's seven and two, you know, he just hasn't had that many opportunities to step in the cage. I do think though, to your point, if he does not get finished in the early going, which is a little bit presumptuous, but I just have to imagine like Edmund is a guy that's, you know, you have the current champion, Drickus Duplessis, goes to decision with Brad Tavares. Edmund Shabazi knocked him out in the first round, and it wasn't competitive. So it's like, that's the thing. At his best, he's a very dangerous guy. And I think that Dobson might be there to be hit. So that's the things I'm concerned about is in the early going, I'm a little worried. You know, Petrosian will just leg kick you to death and like kind of just like take the win however he can get it. He's not mm-hmm. a prolific knockout artist at this level. Edmund kind of is. But – Beyond that, I do worry always about these guys at minus 225. When you know, if this is the eight-minute mark, you're clenching. And maybe Dobson just doesn't push enough of a pace to get him tired. I think that is a mild concern. But overall, I just feel that the later this fight goes, the more it favors Dobson by it, by hook or by crook, whether it's a decision, a late finish. Like, I just think he can kind of eat this out and make it close if it extends. But if this fight was to end in round one, Either guy could win it, but I think Edmund would be pretty substantially favored there just because of what we know about him, which is that he's pretty fast, mobile. He can mix in his own wrestling attacks uh, that I think are a little bit better uh, than Dobson in round one. So those are a couple of my concerns for Dobson because I wanted to back him as an underdog here. I was like, some proximity to Mark Coleman. Like, my man is coming for all the glory. Ohio in the building, baby, stand up. But then I just got a little bit uh, worried when I was, like, looking at some of the stuff on his Instagram. And I was like, damn, he's dealt with some real, you know, personal problems. But um, I, I'm rooting for him. Uh, I just think he he might have his hands full here. Edmund's a tough guy in that first run. Yeah, I'm glad we're we're thinking the same thing there. It's, it's just hard to get to a specific side. But Edmund round one, depending on the number, depending where you get it, might be a good look. Co-main event time, we have Carl Williams against Justin Taffa. We pretty much know what's going to happen in this fight. It's either Justin Taffa getting an early knockout, at least in my opinion, or it's Carl Williams wrestling for 15 minutes unless he gets the finish. Uh, Williams, I believe he's a D3 wrestler coming out of Atlanta. Uh, My boy Dan... From half the battle has D three wrestling in the house, baby. Stand up, yes, Baldwin sir. Wallace, six in the country. All right, stand up, Ohio. Yeah, Car Williams has uh, shown the proficiency to wrestle in his UFC fights that he's had, and uh, that has helped him to to back to back victories in the cage. Uh, uses it to his advantage. Does I mean it looks like he does tend to gas out as the fight goes on, but. The, the volume of wrestling that he he shoots is next level for the heavyweight division. We haven't really seen anyone go for that many takedowns that's not named Curtis Blades at this point. So Carl Williams, for all I know, could be uh, developing his game. But at 34, you kind of have to, to pause a little bit here. And he does leave a lot of openings on the feet that I think Justin Tafa can take advantage of early on at least. But if Carl Williams gets to Justin Toffa's legs, he's going down. Uh, We've seen on the regional side at least, uh, not in the UFC level, but regional side, Justin Toffa off his back, leaves a lot to be desired, is uh, defensively unaware of what's going on down there in the the grappling. And (sighs) brown battle and jujitsu for Carl Williams, maybe he finds the sub here. Uh, for his first submission victory in the UFC, but who knows? Uh, I side with Carl Williams just for the wrestling upside and just because he's been able to prove it over three rounds multiple times in the UFC. Yeah, I I tend to agree with you here, but I will say like the prospect of laying the minus 190 here with Carl Williams, it didn't appeal to me like it did to some people. Like I I just look at it and I say to myself, you know, do do I want to stand with a guy named Badman? No. I'm, I'm trying to take him down 100%, but that's a predictable game plan. You know, we've seen power punchers kind of pick off wrestlers sometimes that are a little bit too one note with that. Put it behind punches, right? That's a um, MMA fundamental. So that way they don't know that they can drop their hands and just wait to uppercut you into the backside of Hades, like a Marge Simpson bus driver uppercut. So I just think that we got to, um, you know, 
be a little bit realistic with the fact that Carl is a little bit undersized at heavyweight. And, um, you know, he's, he's going out there shooting a lot of takedowns, but not always getting all the takedowns that he's shooting. I think he kind of sold us a little bit of fool's gold with that Jimmy Lawson performance. Um, and not to say that Jimmy Lawson is a real deal. Holyfield. That's the thing that's really impressive about it. It's like, he's an actual good, um, wrestler, right. Wrestled at a very high level. And he's also a Tom DeBloss purple belt. So it's like, there, he checks a lot of boxes for a guy that should be really able to challenge Carl, but Carl's clearly physically strong. He's a guy that knows what he wants to do to win the fight. And I think that that's ultimately going to get it done here in the apex center. But like when the UFC booked this, I can tell you um, they didn't care about this card at all, but to the extent that they did care, they would prefer if Tafa could just splatter this guy because he's been having a bunch of really boring fights in my opinion. Um, and, and I do think that's the one concern here. Uh, for Carl, it's like, if you continue to have really boring fights, they're going to try and match make you to get brutally finished. So um, he's got to try and find the finishes, right? Like he's got a lot of dominant positions, a lot of control time in some of these fights and done fuck all with it. And I do think that's a little bit irritating to the matchmakers. Um, he should have exerted more of his advantage in some of these fights. So I'd like to see him take that career step forward to your point. If you're a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu brown belt and you're taking Tafa to the ground, submit him, please. You know, like, yeah. Be serious. And I sure hope so. Uh, let's do Carl Williams by sub. Let's go ahead and get that plus 650 home. Last but not least, we have the main event. Amanda Hibas going up against Rose Namajunas. And my guy, Liam, take the show. Oh, I'll do it. But uh, I don't feel great about it, man. I have to make a pick on all these fights. And um, at the end of the day... <laughs> I don't feel great about either one of these fighters. You know, I've lost money betting on some, uh, like I, I lost money with overconfidence on Amanda Hibas. I uh, lost money fading Rose Namajunas, right? So like, these are not systems that have gone well for me. But when you look, I, I actually have made money fading Rose Namajunas. I'm lying now, but I've lost money more times than I've won it. I just won it for a big amount because I had 10 units on Carlos Barza. I, I read the market on that one. I'll just leave it at that. And uh, I just thought it was going to go one way. It went one way. Uh, it was the weirdest fight of all time. Look into it. But when oh, you just watch that fight back, like there was no attempt to fight. What do I make of that? I, I don't know. The Manon Faro fight, you know, it just seemed like one woman carried a lot more power than the other. Um, here's the concerning thing for me about Rose, just like from a, a broad standpoint that doesn't get talked about anymore. But like she got, you know, very tired against uh, Jessica Andraj when she was pressured and forced to just retreat around the octagon. And by the third round of that fight, the reason it ended up, you know, getting draw scorecards, it's like, I'm just walking her down with impunity and like pressuring her to the point where she was kind of, you know, starting to wilt, you know, pretty evidently. And some other women who have been able to take, you know, the early shots from Rose and then push her have been able to find some success. She's kind of taken a little bit more of a defensive posture in some of these recent fights. And so, the thing that's a huge concern for me on Amanda Hibas, period, point blank, in every fight she has in the UFC, is I think her chin is very liable. I actually picked Luana Pinheiro, uh, or whoever she fought last. Um, I, I may be butchering the name. It was one of the other Brazilian women that she came up with, actually, mm -hmm. and they, they've they trained together since they were young. They fought like cats and dogs out there, man. That was a brutal fight. And um, what it impressed me, though, is when you don't knock out Amanda Hibas, she's willing to get hit about the head, neck, and chest with shoe leather and keep coming forward. Dude, she had welts. She had marks. She got busted up, and she did not care. One iota. Just kept pressing forward with her offense, with her game plan. Didn't have any good defense to, to be reasoned with. But she had heart and intensity, and looks like she's got the right supplement portfolio as well. And, uh, you know, she did a lot right. When, when I watched that fight, in terms of breaking down her opponent and outlasting her, and forcing her to work and breaking her down with pressure. And that is kind of like the Andrade game plan. And the one thing I will say about Amanda Hibas that I feel doesn't always get um, the credit it deserves is her grappling is sensational. Um, when you look at the fact that, you know, Caitlin Chukagian has a serious, serious black belt. She's a very good grappler. Very few people have systematically out grappled her. And the people that have, they all have the same thing in common. They're physically stronger than her and bigger. She's she's neither of those things, right? She, she's probably a little physically stronger, but she's clearly smaller than Chukagian. 
and she used her judo to get it to the ground, and she used her jiu-jitsu to dominate position. That does not win you fights anymore in 2024, and I found that out the hard way. I lost a lot of units on that fight. But I had the plus 160 underdog who looked like she could have won a split decision there. Um, you know, a lot of iterations of that fight. So when I looked at it, I said, man, you know, am I fundamentally wrong about Amanda Hebas? Then she goes out there and she beats Viviani Araujo. You know, she handles business in some of these spots. And I do think she's very talented. I think she's got a lot of real skills. People forget that she dog walked Mackenzie Dern. And every time they grappled, she won the exchange. And that's not easy to do. I hate to tell people like, just because you don't like Mackenzie Dern doesn't mean that every other woman that grapples her doesn't start acting like they have, you know, stiffness in their joints and they just can't move nothing no more. Everything's stuck like this, like they're a turtle, right? You did see her engage in the grappling and win it. She's engaged in the grappling with a lot of these women and won it. She won the takedown battle with Macy Barber and a bunch of other girls at Flyweight. So Rose went out there one time with a striker, had a striking match, and things went, you know, wavy gravy. It was all fine. It was all cool in the game. And she could come out here and head kick this woman in the first round. Make no mistake about that. But this is another fight where I feel the longer it goes, the better you'd feel about having Amanda Hebos in your pocket. She was pushing a hellacious pace last time out, seemed unconcerned about that fact. I think that her chin at 125 has been tested by some of these powerful girls like Macy Barber. But mm-hmm. even in that fight, again, who's getting the takedowns? Who's getting the, the bulk of the forward action? It's like Amanda Hebos can mix it up in those positions. It's just that whether it's at 115 and she has to cut a bunch of weight to get punched in the face and that compromises her chin, or she has to fight somebody bigger than her and they punch her in the face real hard and it compromises her chin. She has a chin that can be compromised and you got a girl in Rose Nami Yunus that can target the chin. So for me, I feel like this fight should end inside the distance more often than not, but I could also see Amanda Hebos implementing a smart game plan where she tries to mitigate damage, not get hit by this woman, move around, skirt around, do the Carla Esparza shake boogie and dance. And everybody just goes home, you know, with a split decision and uh, hopes that the judges call their name, you know? So that's the thing that worries me about betting the total here. You know, if they gave me even money plus plus one twenty five, I'm, I'm there. Minus 180 for a women's fight, not to go the distance. I mean, you know, don't, don't slap me in the face, you know, don't, don't try and take my money. Um, you know? And so I just feel like at, a 65 plus percent indication or whatever, as it starts to get in some of these places, it's like disgusting. Like they're just trying to keep me off that, that play. And uh, maybe an alternate under or something uh, for a small amount, you know, a couple of different ways I've thought of getting creative here, but it, it just seems to me like a fight that could go either way. And in that kind of fight, I'm normally going to take the underdog. Has that gone well for me? Um, you know, against Rose Nami Yunus only one time. Um, and I tried with Zhang Wei Lee, ran it back, lost the paper both times. So, you know, I've been there a couple of times on the wrong side of Rose and it doesn't feel good. You know, she's a good fighter, but I do think that in this fight, it's anybody's matchup. And uh, one of them's a plus 180 underdog. So I'm going to lean with Amanda Hebas here. I think the longer the fight goes, the more it favors her because I think she could push a, a great pace. And I think she can mix in the takedowns, the wrestling, the grappling, try and get on top of Rose and put her in some vulnerable positions. But I also think people that sleep on Rose's offensive jujitsu are fooling themselves because Amanda Hebos does, uh, you know, the chicken dance. Sometimes she gets rocked. She's on ice skates. And if you get punched in the face one time, you're a brown belt. You get punched in the face three times, you're a purple belt. You know, you just start going down the list. It's like, eventually you got a white belt in front of you and you just snatch their neck and that's the end of it. So I do think that Leon in the, the chat with Rose sub plus 1500, there's probably worse bets in the world. Um, because she is kind of a club and subber, right? She has good finishing instincts, but we've also seen the opposite from her, right? She had Yoani and Jacek out. She could basically have done whatever she wanted. And um, instead she goes bang, bang, and just starts throwing, unloading on her head. So I think that, you know, it's a tricky, uh, you know, bet to make because you don't know that that's going to be her preference. But at 15 to one, you don't have to be right every time to make money. So you know, I, I don't think that's a horrible way to look. And uh, I think the ends by sub has some equity as well. A um, couple of different ways you could look at this, but great fight. Yeah, great breakdown there. And a lot of the, the points I wanted to cover specifically. And just to add on to it, because uh, I have similar feelings on the outcome. Uh, I would not lay the chalk on on Rose. I'd probably take Rebus, uh, whether it's a plus five and a half or uh, if I just take her outright on the money line. The, the main concern, obviously, is the chin. But the, the biggest concern for me is a couple of weeks ago, literally just a couple of weeks ago, you look at Rose's Instagram and you see her physically out of shape, 
like very, very out of shape. And uh, to lose that amount of weight in such short time can affect your cardio. Uh, I'm not sure if it's just a crash diet that she did or uh, whether she just put in the time and really lost the weight uh, in a healthy manner. But if it was done the wrong way, she definitely uh, could have lost a lot of the, that cardio that she once had. And against Amanda Hibas, you do not want to slow down. That is a risky proposition to, to go ahead and uh, come forward with, especially when fighting a fighter who likes to weaponize pace. Uh, again, a fascinating fight where I think both fighters can finish. Both fighters can win by decision. Both, both fighters can... Uh, they have all the methods to, to win this fight, uh, whether knockout, submission, or decision. And uh, it's a great way to cap off a, a pretty decent fight night, in my opinion. Although we have uh, a lot of weird matchups and uh, UFC uh, returners, if that if that's a word. Uh, I'm excited for tomorrow. Uh, any UFC fight night is a, is a good fight night. Uh, but I, Liam, once again, I appreciate you for, for hopping on the stream. This has been really fun. And uh, I believe this is our longest episode to date. And it, was, it didn't even feel like an hour and a half. Time flew by. Uh, let the people know where they can find you, where they can find your work, and uh, what you have going on leading up to this card. Absolutely, brother. I appreciate you. Uh, you can always find the the work that I'm doing on my Patreon. It's linked in my uh, Twitter. Um, you know, I, I put a lot of time, effort, and energy into the the stuff that I do. Um, so I, I take a lot of pride in that work. I, if I ever put a play up there, all I can assure you is that it's going to have a lot of thought behind it. Uh, it's going to be backed by my money and I'm going to try my best. What I can't promise you is a lot of the gimmicky bullshit. People say, I'm a, a it's a lock. I'm going to win every time. Like I, I win 52% of events versus 48% that I lose over the course of a long time track in these, uh, you know, events. But I come out ahead at the end of the year, year over year, the last few years. And I'm going to continue trying to do that. That's my goal. Make plus EV bets all the time and put a lot of hard work, effort, and energy into it. Um, so I'd never just say, hey, take my pick and ride with this. Never. What I would say is take this information, review it yourself. Here's the reasons I've gotten to this play. Here's the reasons I believe I'm getting the best of it. And if you agree, then, you know, take this risk, but make an educated risk with me. Don't fire into, you know, things where you you have just no game plan. Everything I do is calculated. And so when I took an L on UFC 299, man, I put in the same amount of hard work, effort, energy, the same intensity, and it didn't work out. And a lot of people in that moment are like, all right, I'm going to change everything. This is all bogus. I don't know nothing. I'm like, no, I still know the game. I'm going to get back to work. I'm going to win next week. And I won next week. So that's my approach is never let your highs get you too high. Never let your lows get you too low. Find me anywhere. Pick and fights at Liam picks fights. I have a ton of free information. If you want to go one step further, come to the Patreon. We could, you could ask me any question you want directly. I'll let you know what my thoughts on it. And uh, that's the bottom line. I, I'm proud of my work. So I'm happy to share it with people. And uh, I appreciate you guys for joining us in the chat. I appreciate all the sharp people um, that stop by. I appreciate all the people that support me and I appreciate my brother Wiz. It's been an honor and a pleasure to come back on the show, my brother, and I uh, wish you nothing but continued success. My guy, Liam, thank you so much for always being such a good guest and for taking the time out of your day, staying up and uh, joining us on the show. It was really fun. Glad I had you on. And I'm sure we'll do this again in the future, whether on my channel or on yours. Uh, we'll have talks in the DMs. I have a couple of ideas. But guys, thank you so much for, for being active in the chat. If you haven't already, please smash that like button. Really appreciate it. And uh, until next week, we have a couple of uh, new guests stopping by. And the subscribe show. to Brother Wiz right now. Stop what you're doing. I'm telling you, it's a personal favor to me. Stop what you're doing and subscribe to Brother Wiz. Let's keep that train going up for my guy and uh, quality content. Quality content rains out. Keep it going, brother. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. All right, guys. We'll see y'all next week with another interview. I have a UFC fighter lined up for an interview. And I have another member of MMA Twitter lined up. So two a weeks for uh, the foreseeable future. Let's get it. I'll see you all next week. Peace.